Is the new Arcane Roots album good? We're going to find out on this episode of the Mostly Existential Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Mostly Existential Podcast. My name is Justin. I'm still Kenneth. And this is a show where we review music and film, new album or film every single week. Um... We're excited. Today we're going to be checking out the new album from Arcane Roots, a three-piece progressive rock post-hardcore band based in England, fronted by Andrew Groves, who serves as the main musical mind of the project, performing duties of vocals, guitar, and more recently keyboard, which we'll see a lot of on this record, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Before we do, we're going to get into some news here. Kenneth, you want to start us off with some sad news? So, two for two NPR, like from downtown. Yeah. Like every time, like I feel like, you know, I'm like, I don't want to pull from NPR again, but NPR, I just like their product. They have such a diverse um, news network that, like, it's, you could get a lot of stuff from NPR and exclusively NPR. Absolutely. I just, you know, like a lot of things that they do. Like, so mm-hmm. it's just like, okay, two for two from downtown NPR is with these new articles. So, mm-hmm. um, Charles Bradley, Screaming Eagle of Soul, has passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, as somebody who likes soul as a genre, I kind of like, I kind of fell out of it a little bit like this year and didn't follow up. So it was kind of like, whoa, okay. But the reason why I picked this story is this man's life is so interesting in his trajectory to music in the sense of I was reading somewhere else that he didn't release his first debut album till he was 62. And that was, yeah, wow. yeah, that was, I think it was 2011, something like that. That's and, crazy. Right. Like, and so the one thing that I will say is like, even though, you know, I'm very into music and you're very into music and, you know, generally speaking, most people like music. We think of soul as this sort of, you know, kind of anything that you're going to hear of soul is just basically like, Oh, we just still listen to these records from this era. Yeah. And so the fact that like in 2011, somebody was making soul albums and putting out soul albums and new music and touring. Yeah. was just crazy to me. Like if you read the article, which we'll have a link to, he was just talking, uh, it was talking about how he, you know, it took him so long to finally get a break that he did, He left his house when he was 14 and he did do music, but like the Vietnam draft, like basically broke up his band Mm -hmm. and that he would just kind of do shows as like a James Brown impersonator and stuff like that. And then somebody finally caught hold to him and he just kind of took it and ran with it for as long as he can until he passed away and that was just crazy to me. Like his life is so interesting and just mm-hmm. that idea that artists like keep going after it, keep creating, keep like, it, it was kind of, it, it was so like reading this article and reading up more about him was so like, inspiring right because here's a guy who's been wanting to do this for years and even when it wasn't big he was just like i'm just gonna do what i love for sure and i'm just gonna keep doing it Mm -hmm. and that eventually paid off yeah and you know he talked about how he just loved doing music anyway so it's just like yo it was nuts. Like yeah. it's just so crazy. And that's why I chose this article. Cause as I was reading it, I was like in my room, I was like, dang, this guy just never quit. Like yeah. he actually just never quit. Yeah. And, that is awesome. That's absolutely cool. Yeah. So rest in peace, Charles Bradley. Yeah, definitely. Definitely rest in peace for sure. Um, so I've got <clears throat> two related articles here. Ooh. Um, 
both having to do with kind of the same thing. These are both coming from the fader.com. Okay. Um, I mean, these, I'm sure these articles have also been posted elsewhere. I think I also saw that NPR one elsewhere too. Of course, everyone's going to report on common news. Um, but, uh, so these are talking about, so the first one <clears throat> is talking about how Stevie wonder took a neon stage at the global citizen festival. Mm-hmm. Um, which just reading what he said was just really interesting. First of all, so he said, tonight I'm taking a knee for America. So uh, to digress, this is, of course, in response to the whole football thing with um, Donald Trump and all that. Um, so he was at this festival and he, he took a knee um, during his headlining set. And he said, I'm taking uh, a knee for America, but not just one knee. I'm taking both knees, both knees in prayer for our planet, our future, our leaders of the world. Mm. And I quote, amen. And he, and then this is the most Stevie wonder thing he could have said. He, he ended it with, I wanted to say that prayer before I serve you my musical meal. Yo, (laughs) how, how just so Stevie, right? Like that's just so just the confidence and just the, um, and then it goes on just to say that he was met with like a roar of applause, et cetera, et cetera. Um, doesn't there, there's like a video of it too. If you're interested, of course the link will be in there, but, um, a related thing. And I don't know if you heard about this. I feel like you might've, but J Cole went on this whole like Twitter rant thing regarding the, the kneeling. I, I saw that. And here's the thing of that's when I recognized Yo, this is like for real, for real, because J. Cole's such a reclusive artist. Mm -hmm. And so an artist that is reclusive like that of that magnitude saying like, okay, I need to hop on social media and say something about it. I was like, okay, Uh all right, we're we're moving. So he he had some really interesting things to say about it, stuff that honestly hadn't really like heard a lot of people talking about which Mm. i haven't really gone looking for news about it either so yeah keep that in mind but um he basically makes a suggestion that you know kneeling cool totally behind that but we as people the best thing we can do is just straight up not watch um yeah and he was making the suggestion that unfortunately in the way that the world is, no one's going to listen to you unless you're taking money out of their pockets. And the way mm. you take money out of their pockets is by not watching because the less viewers, the less advertising um, money that they get, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he was like, he went on to say that he, you know, he finds courage in everyone who's participating in the kneeling thing. But we as viewers, if we truly care, like we can, just not watch. And he was saying like, as a football fan, he was like, it felt hard at first, like in the preseason and everything. But then he just kind of reminded himself just like, you know what? Like I have ancestors who like walked for this stuff. And this isn't, this is not that hard. Mm -hmm. And so for him, he was just like, it's not that hard. I just have to think about that. And what people have done in the past that have been way harder than just not watching a football game. And he's like, I can just, yeah, that's fine. I'm just not watch it. Um, he also said was like, you can do whatever you want and that's fine. He, yeah. he wasn't saying you guys are terrible if you're watching the game. And I kind of liked that he, he had his sentiment like that. He was mm-hmm. just like, this is my personal thing. This is how, and he also was just like, I'm not that qualified to speak on this. I'm just a rapper, but here's just one idea that I had. Yeah. Which and I did, I do appreciate about. Yeah, Paul. I, I, I certainly respect the way in which he's delivered his opinion here. He even said like there might be people smarter than me with better answers, but here's here's just one thing, and he basically suggested like you know we can just boycott it by not watching. Yeah, um, and that is true. That's a really interesting thought that he put and. This article also includes the entire Twitter rant, which is like 22 tweets long. It, it's worth a read. It's really interesting. And I think it's delivered in such a way that is palpable. Even if you disagree, he's not mm-hmm. attacking anyone for having a different opinion. Um, 
really interesting stuff. And like you said, it is really interesting that he's, you know, coming out of his reclusive nature to give his bit on right. this. And, I mean, I think he might be on tour right now. I'm not too sure, but it's just kind of like yeah. he just typically doesn't engage with Twitter. And I know. Um, yeah, because it actually starts off and he wasn't sure how to do like a Twitter thread. Yeah. So like that's he was like, hold on, how do you do a thread? Oh, OK. And then he, yeah. he, he does his his bit. So it kind of shows like he's not that active on Twitter and certainly doesn't have a history of doing things like this. Yeah. Um. But it's cool to see him coming out and um, expressing this opinion in this way that he hasn't really done in the past. So clearly he must be passionate to a certain yeah, degree about is, it. So this is kind of. Um, and I, I guess kind of one thing, if we talked about this in season one mm-hmm. and just to touch on it briefly, but it's just like. Seems that a lot of people care more about the symbolism of what this is supposed to stand for. And so, like, and so I, I understand people disagreeing and saying I wouldn't sit for the national anthem because I feel like it's respectful to the troops to right. not do that. And I understand that sentiment. <clears throat> but also at the same time, know that the people who are kneeling, it is their right yeah. to sit and protest. And if the NFL allows it, which they have been, they have the right to do so. Mm hmm. So when I get very like hard pressed when people are like, oh, this should be fired and this and that is like, no, that's up to the NFL's discretion. The NFL says we're going to stand by your First Amendment right to protest or mm-hmm. is that the First Amendment? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going <laughs> to uh, if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. Fine. Um, but we're going to stand behind your right to protest peacefully mm-hmm. and you can do that. That's the end of it. The one thing that I will say, though, is. I don't feel that this is disrespectful to the troops until somebody comes out and it's just like, fuck the troops. Right. But nobody's done that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. And this is just, it's kind of, I, I just laugh because I know that a lot of this, the new kind of firestorm about this was surged by Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know people who have supported Trump who said this thing was going to like change and it hasn't. And in fact, it's he he certainly united everybody on the same front with this. Like we have more participation in the, the kneeling thing and all that right. since he said something. In fact, it's been like way more participation. Right. So, I mean. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let's go ahead and get into our review here. Um, so we're going to be looking at the new album from Arcane Roots, um, Melancholia Hymns. Uh, it's the second full length LP, uh, which follows up their 2015 EP, Heaven and Earth. A project that, to me, had an air of like a stagnating band, given its musical, visual, and even naming symmetry to their first LP in 2013, Blood and Chemistry. Not to say it was a bad EP, but I think for me there was this fear that they were going to just do the same thing. Um, But this newer album, if anything, it puts the fears of a stagnating band to rest with a new musical direction and a visual aesthetic to match. Um, but I'm curious, what were your thoughts on the record? Okay. So as someone who is not really into prog rock, right. I plugged this into, you know, my car and I was driving to school and that first track Mm -hmm. took very long to get started. Yes. In my yes. Opinion, I, was I, like, I, I like had to look at my phone. I was like, am I playing this? Okay. Yeah. I'm playing the song. Okay. <laughs> right. Like it was just one of those things where it like kept going and it kept building and it kept building and it kept building and it got delicious. And I was like, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I could have done with like less of the buildup. Yeah. But I know that there's a reason for everything. So it's yeah. just like, okay, cool. 
They actually have a history of doing that, too, believe it or not. And there are moments on this record that I'm like, this buildup is taking a little bit longer than I feel like it should. But Mm. uh, going through this record, and I know we're going to do a track by track here soon. I. I'm very torn in it. I will sit here and express that it is very well made. They do a great job on their instruments. The Mm. instrumental is tight. The lyrics fit in. But I feel that um, sometimes they're my immersions like broken. They have tracks that are very, you know, guitar heavy, very drum heavy, you know, very in your face. And then the next track after that will be kind of a little electronic and subdued, especially I know there's a point later in the album and we'll get to that. But other than that, I've, yeah, the album was fine. I, I, I enjoyed most of it. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the most divisive opinion you've had thus far. Like, it's just four like, episodes. Yeah. It's just kind of like, Oh, three. Sorry. three. Yeah. It's just kind of like, Oh yeah. Parts of these are really, really dope. And then other parts I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so um, let, let's start off with before me, um, the very first tune on the record. It of course, it does start with like the really long staticky drones. And even at the very beginning, it's so quiet that it's hard to know that the song's playing. And it's funny because when I said they have a history of this, their last album, it starts off with extreme quiet and you're like wait am i listening to the song and you kind of turn it up especially it does something that like not a lot of records do their last one where he's like singing and whatnot but you have to kind of turn it up to hear it Mm. but if you don't turn it down when the song kicks in you're gonna get your like ears like punched in the face (laughs) (laughs) this one doesn't do that quite as much it has more of a gradual build but um so th- this album kind of starts out with these heavy electronic elements. It's like staticky um, sounds along with these like string patches and everything. Um, and I think it definitely shapes the production style that the record has. And it definitely gives you an idea of what you're in for. Um, mm mm-hmm. And the vocals kind of remain in the background of like this huge soundscape and Bits of it remind me a lot of um, uh, an album, The Mountain from Haken, a band that I've showed you at least a few songs Mm of. um, And it kind of feels like I'm starting a really intense movie. Yeah. It feels like I don't know what's coming, but I know it's going to be epic Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And... Well, yeah, it does definitely kind of drag on. It is a pretty long opening tune for being more of an intro to the album. But overall, I I find the tune kind of just captivating, ethereal and haunting. And then we kind of get to the three minute 15 mark and it kind of switches up into more of like. um, More softer and almost kind of like dream pop inspired. And And uh, when we get to the latter half of that particular song mm -hmm. and it finally kind of picks up and does that change. I'm like, Oh, okay. 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 We're here now. Yeah. And, and I don't think that that buildup was bad by mm -hmm. any metric. I just felt like it overstayed and it it kind of went on too long because I can feel that because as somebody who is necessarily not in, you know, not really in the know with this kind of music or this band, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm kind of just coming in fresh and it's like, okay, you're doing the buildup. Okay. We're still doing the buildup. We're still doing the buildup. And even though, you know, this record is however long it is, it feels like it elongates the song. Mm -hmm. It makes it feel longer than what it actually is. There, there's this interesting thing on this album that I feel like a lot of songs almost play out in like two acts. Yeah. And so this song certainly follows that where after about three or so minutes, you kind of have the soundscape kind of drop and more of just kind of like this electronic, like beat with the, you know, kind of like eight Oh eight inspired drum mm-hmm. kicks. 
And um, then it kind of goes back into more of a traditional tune when it starts to like explode in the very end of it. And he kind of does this thing that that he's been kind of known to do where he just kind of repeats this lyrical message while it's just kind of building musically. And that happens at multiple points on this record and others. And yeah. it almost feels like um, like worship music inspired because it's something that you've seen like a lot of worship tunes where it's like you're repeating this lyrical idea while the music is kind of building on top of it and you're just enhancing the melody and the power. And it's something that to me, like that kind of musical crescendo feels derived from that style of music, which is definitely interesting. Um, so are you saying that arcane roots took us to church? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, yeah, they totally. took us to church, taught us a lesson and brought us back so we could, you know, go to anywhere except Chick-fil-A afterward. <laughs> I'm going to create a place called just Sundays, just Sundays. So it's going to be open. <laughs> I had tangent, but it's going to be open from when Chick-fil-A closes like every night it's going to be open overnight from when Chick-fil-A closes to when Chick-fil-A opens and then all day Sunday. That's pretty good. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. Anyway. Um, and it's interesting because before me also has like the, um, little like tiny interlude at the end too, which to me, I feel like the way that tension builds to me, like it kind of like my muscles were tensed up and everything. And then that little interlude, let me just, it was like a reminder to breathe. Mm. I was like, <sighs> Okay. All right. <laughs> and then it kind of moves into the next song, which was matter, which was actually the second single on the record. I like well. this record. I like this song. It was definitely, I will say if you like this song, this was a little bit closer to their traditional offerings yeah. as a band. Um, with it emphasizing more of their traditional band arrangement. Cause this is actually, a th it's a three piece band, which right. you wouldn't know it by listening to it. No, not at all. Um, but it's got your more typical, like guitar based drums, vocals arrangement, which is actually, um, interesting because a lot of the songs that I do like, on this album have that sort of more traditional arrangement which is interesting which means you'd probably be more into their older material mm. um i just want to say the the chorus on matter is just so bombastic and just it's so good it's so good and so in your face and the bridge of this song is everything that i've always loved about arcane roots where it gets kind of rhythmically weird and it's the first moment that captures like the heavier elements of like their last um, full length album. Um, and this song again ends on like kind of a, an electronic interlude. Um, but yeah, matter really interesting tune. I could see why it's a single, um, especially cause we'll get the first single was curtains and yeah. we'll get to that song in a little bit here, but matter definitely, I feel like would have calmed the worries of an album that, would potentially abandon past mm -hmm. material. So matter definitely makes sense as a second single for me. Um, also a song that I, I liked as well. Um, moving on to Indigo. This was a really soft tune. Tell me your thoughts on it. I think that again, just kind of, that whole thing of coming off of matter going into indigo, mm -hmm. um, just kind of, you know, and I've expressed this before. Um, it just was, it kind of took the momentum out for me and I'm like, okay, so, you know, we have before me and then it has its build up. Cool. Then we get to matter bombastic track. And then we get to indigo and it's kind of like, we're doing this kind of dip in the mm -hmm. feel of the album. And I was like, Oh, okay. And not to say that Indigo is a bad record. I actually, you know, enjoyed bits of it. I mm -hmm. actually, you know what? I enjoyed Indigo as a record, as a song. It, it was definitely interesting. And it had, um, I mean, one thing I find interesting in general is the amount of, of that softer stuff, more ballady type stuff. That's actually like probably almost half the record, mm. at least within, um, there'll be at least huge portions of songs that are like that. Um, 
And so you do have your moments like matter and like some of the later tunes like solemn um, and some sections of other songs. But I think a lot of this record is more of the slower tempoed Mm -hmm. uh, kind of stuff that is not so driving and forward. But uh, this presents a familiarity to like the ballad structure of some of the past works that they've done, the past ballads, which haven't ever been such a huge part of a record like this one has. Um, But it kind of takes the electronic elements and kind of really shows that they're there in a really special way. And I think this is the first instance of like it being a payoff, this new element to the band, this heavy electronic element, the, because Andrew Groves has has brought on the keyboard um, and let it change the writing style. This is, to me, where I, at the point in the album where I go, okay, I'm glad that this is a thing. Um, and it's not just like a gimmick. And I feel like this song has so many of those electronic elements and it's so dense with a lot of musical things that are going on and that they build and layer in a special way. Mm. And it's almost like some of the songs almost feel like sequenced, but they're really cool in the way that they do that, where they add and remove elements to kind of engage you. And this song in particular, Indigo, I feel like could work almost just as effectively as an instrumental song. Because if you just listen to the instrumental, it carries you through the tune um, with, again, adding and removing elements as appropriate. And so as just an electronic track, it sounds really great. Not to say that Groves doesn't add anything to the song. I think he definitely does. But um, cer- certainly an interesting tune. I um I will say that the more electronic, you know, songs on this album do feel like they fit in more aesthetically with like the album cover and kind of yeah. theme. The the visual direction for this album is, is certainly different from stuff in the past. And it does fit, like you said, the electronic elements with even the cinematography direction in the music videos and like the single artwork. Yeah. Um, all of that stuff. It really does make sense. And it feels just inspired by clearly different things. And it it just kind of furthers the notion that this electronic element is something that's important to the band's direction and not just some, Oh, I guess we're just going to do this on this album. I Mm. guess it certainly didn't feel like it was just a gimmicky thought. Right. Um, so moving on to off the floor. I feel like you probably would have liked this song. Uh, Yeah, you are 100% correct. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because this one, if you like this song, this song reminds me of how much I love his guitar work. Mm -hmm. Because even just that opening guitar lick is so just weird. (sighs) But it's so good. And it's a very unique playing style. Delicious. A lot of just single note work or just very like syncopated rhythms. And just interesting chord changes. It's an incredibly punchy tune. This was, uh, I think, the third single off the record. And, um, I mean, I'm such a huge fan of this song. Just being a fan of their previous work and also just as a guitar enthusiast. There was so much to love about it because of that. And it makes sense that because you weren't as into the electronic elements that told me you were probably going to like this song. Right. And I I think that's kind of one of the things, again, I don't listen to a lot of prog rock, but like, you know, of what I've been showed by friends, you and otherwise, like this is definitely more of the things that I like about that sub genre. Mm -hmm. And so when it was, so when it played, I was like, yo, this is, this is it right here. Like, this is exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what I want. And it's being delivered right to my ears. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and it's like, even though it has like some keyboard in there and Which it's, it's fun, very yeah. much just, uh, kind of underlaid 
across everything else and it's probably one of the most like traditional just three piece arrangements that are on this song although again another interesting thing is that this song doesn't really have like a pop song structure to it like a verse chorus verse chorus bridge yeah kind of thing and i think a lot of the songs don't but this one was very apparent in that um so yeah the, not surprised that you're into that tune i also <laughs> am very into off the floor um that's like a song that like i think about and go back to agreed um now we get to the first single of the album which is curtains this was the first i had actually heard this song before i listened to the album mm. and that's how i knew that the album was coming yeah i just happened to be on youtube and it was like oh new arcane root single and i was like all right yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. All right, that's a dance. So, I'm very curious about your thoughts on this one because it does blend a lot of elements. <sighs> Curtains. I. I feel like. Curtains. Like you said, it does blend a lot of elements together. I just think that Curtains wasn't necessarily for me. Not to say that I'd mm. say a bad record. Very well made. This whole album, very well made. It's just coming off of something that I liked so much. And I think that maybe if I listen to this album in like a machete order, maybe there might be something else. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, there might be something here for me because. I, it just, it, it, I, I think so many things of this album are just where it's placed. And I think that might be part of why I don't like certain elements and why I do like certain elements. But it's like, like I said, Off the Floor was right for Kenneth. Mm-hmm. Totally right there. Totally perfect. And so then we get to Curtain and it felt like, it did feel like a good coming together mm-hmm. of these elements into this track. But having it behind Off the Wall for me just kind of, made it less of what I want because you just gave me everything that I want. And then you're giving me less of that. And so I ended up liking the song a little bit less. I'm sure if it would have been after Indigo, maybe like I might have a different reason, but it's just like, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I feel about it. I thought the, I thought the song was okay. Um, but I didn't particularly like it as much as the other songs, the songs that are a little more, um, and I remember I did, I personally felt that there was another, uh, record or the record. There was another song on this record that did a little bit more blending. I think a little bit better and we'll get to that song later. Yeah. I think I also made note of that. I forget which one it is, but I'm sure I'll come across it in my notes here. Um, you're super duper organized notes. <laughs> I'm so jealous of like your note game. Like when it comes you know to what's this weird is I've been awful at taking notes throughout all of my scholastic career. <laughs> Yet for this, I take detailed notes and I organize. Them. Yeah. I just, it, it's just one of those things where it's like, usually because I'm so busy and I'm constantly like in transit or at school. Yeah. I'm listening to these records when I'm like studying or like writing stuff down for another class yeah, or, you know, stuff like that. Or I'll be like walking to my car and driving home and I'm like, Oh, I should probably write this down. Yeah. And then I'll just be like in my car. And then by the time I get home, I'm like, I just want to lay down and I I go to school today. It's exhausting. Well, what I end up doing, excuse me, not to digress too far here, but, um, I'll I'll give like a first listen and I'll usually not make almost any notes. Yeah. I'm just kind of getting a feel for the album. And that one, I'll the first listen I'll typically do at my house with my speaker set up and everything. Then I'll kind of digest the album more so like in the car and whatnot. And then usually on Sunday, after I've like gotten to know these songs, then I sit down and I've been just going to like a Starbucks with my headphones in. I listen to the album like and do track by track notes oh, you're telling listen. me that you're in starbucks not writing your screenplay it's true i'm, I'm writing <laughs> this <laughs> um 
But yeah, I I do feel that uh, there's a track I think that blends a little bit better toward the end of the record. Um, it's funny because curtains I probably had the most different opinion from you on. So I felt like this was a, a the second payoff of the electronic elements where it really proved that this the electronic tones and just general musical direction are now are deeply embedded element into what they're trying to do from here on out and it's shown by the guitar not even starting till halfway through the song Mm -hmm. which as a lead single is such a bold choice um but at the end of the song it just explodes and a lot of songs do this, and it's one thing that I really like on the record, but the song in particular just absolutely explodes into probably one of the heaviest moments on the entire record. And so to me, it serves as a bold but highly effective first single as it transitions from the most electronic to probably the most heavy progressive post-hardcore elements, giving me as a listener perhaps the best idea of the tonal range on the album. And I'll say, having listened to it prior to the record, it gave me, I feel like it helped me approach this album in an appropriate way, especially as a fan who might have been expecting something closer to their last LP. Mm -hmm. Um, But this as a first single, when I listened to it, I was admittedly slightly divisive on it because it was so different from their last offering and it was so electronically forward. Um, but the ending gave me kind of like a hope of just like, okay, there's still going to be this on the album. Um, but overall, I, I still really enjoy the tune. I also found out that the, um, the version that was released as a single is a slightly edited version that cuts it down by like almost 30 plus seconds. Huh. So it's actually a slightly shorter song, which makes sense because, you know, singles being right. like six minutes is hard. The hard to push a yeah, six minute single for sure. Um, also, it makes sense that the single version is shorter since there's an accompanying music video, yeah. So it's like you gotta do more the longer the song is. That's true. Um, so, uh, moving on to Solemn, uh, this. I mean, this song starts off as bold as anything because mm. it just starts off to the bah, bah. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should play with them live and just do that on stage. I'm sure. Everyone <laughs> do you want to do look. it like do you want to make that noise into a mic or do you want to use whatever instrument is to make that sound? Oh, no, I, ju- I just want to do that into a microphone. Perfect. Instead of the band <laughs> playing that part. <laughs> And then they can get into the song. I'll walk off stage respectfully, but I okay, just want to yeah. do that. I just want to <laughs> just like do that and then put your hands up and everybody bow and then you just leave. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so this tune um, had just a really bold intro. Uh, continues on with the lack of a pop song structure and it does so in a way that's just building and layering on top of each other. Um, this This song... Um, I might not actually have a, so this is not the song you were talking about. No, but this song does have probably the most consistent blend of guitar keyboard elements and kind of marries them as like one instrument in this track. And I think that's what makes this Mm -hmm. not a boring track for me. Mm -hmm. I feel like it could have been, but because they're using the guitar and keyboard almost as one instrument, it kind of just creates this massive wall of sound. And this one tune does kind of exemplify how when you're doing this building song structure, it can sometimes be a little fatiguing to listen to. And this song definitely kind of made that more apparent and this is this one song in particular is the probably the most fatiguing for me to listen because its energy is just unwavering and it doesn't give you a lot of moments to breathe and while Mm. it's certainly still captivating it's 
sometimes exhausting. Yeah. And I can see why that would put you off because especially um, a lot of the more electronic songs tend to have that kind of structure to it, which can be great depending on how they do it. Um, like I said, I liked the way before me did it because it, I was so tense and then it let me breathe for a second before the right. next song. Um, solemn is just very, very exhausting to listen to at times. And then I kind of feel like the way they end the song, they just kind of strip the elements like one by one, which is cool. Um, and it provides for like an interesting exit to a song that I don't really think had anywhere else to go. Yeah, because it, you kind of build to this point and then it's just like, all right, well, we're we're done now. It's right. kind of like if you took a really long staircase to the top of a mountain and then just took the elevator down. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of how the song plays out. And so while I don't dislike the song, it was definitely one that didn't immediately stand out to me and gave uh-huh. me some there were certainly some blatant criticisms I had with that tune. And like, like you said, and I share the same sentiment, it's just a very fatiguing song to listen to, um, which I think is a lot. We've said about a lot of records towards their latter half of just like, you know, by the time you're getting to the end of the record, you are, you know, of course, you know, records build like any story would or anything mm-hmm. like you essentially, hopefully should, you know, have a beginning, middle and end and a climax in the middle and the middle is the bulk of your material where your best material should be. But when you're starting to come to the end, I felt like solemn kind of put a fatigue to this album where I don't think it, I don't think this album itself was fatiguing yet for me. Mm hmm. Where it's like, I was, even though I didn't like all of this album, I was like, I'm still with it. I'm still with it. And then you get to Solomon, and you're like, it's so much. And you're like, okay, now yeah. I'm on a straight listen through. I You're fatigued with four songs left. Yeah. Not with two, uh, three, potentially two songs left. Yeah, I, I I will agree with you. I feel like there's just, it kind of suffers a little bit from overstimulus yes. on that tune. Um, moving on to ARP. Love this record. Love this song. Yeah. I love ARP. This it's really weird. Is, it has a lot of the elements that, again, fans of past material are going to love because it has one of the most vocal forward parts, especially in the intro. And you get to really appreciate Andrew Grove's singing chops, something that I think you don't get to see enough of on this record. But um, you get to really appreciate it without it not being drowned out by other elements of the song. And then also in the second half, it really goes into the rhythmically challenging side of their music that I've always loved. And I always love that in, in anyone's stuff when I'm just sitting there like, I don't know what what a uh, time signature this is. And I could count it out, but I don't want to. <laughs> right. And I was thinking about that uh, when I was doing my final listen through like last night. I was just like. I don't even know where like a measure starts or ends here. Yeah. And beautiful. I oh, yeah. do like this track. I do like his vocals. I like that. You know, there's a little bit more of a lead off with the vocals. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're, it felt like you were building around vocals more. So for sure, it was definitely one of the most vocal centric tunes. And I like that about it. Yes, I think, um, coming off of Solemn too, this was the perfect way to kind of revitalize some of that fatigue um, and kind of change it up a little bit um, and, and give us that more traditional offering of something that you would expect out of Arcane Roots. Yeah. And certainly something that's, I mean, I just love his singing voice. It's so interesting sounding. Mm. It's not like, I can't liken him to pretty much any other vocalist not to say he's like the best vocalist ever has the most unique very voice, but unique like, yeah it's certainly something that when i hear it i know it's him instantly so uh yeah so if we get a lot of prog rock singers together to do a posse cut you'd be able to <laughs> oh yeah be, I, i'd pick him out i'd be like this is his verse why are, Check there, it no, out, it's real why tight. are there not as many posse cuts in rock <laughs> 
because they're never successful. Yeah, like, I was about literally to say, like, I don't, think any, how they, I don't know how they would work out. Like most of them don't. I That's think the problem. Like I think rap and like jazz are the only two like genres of music that I can imagine like a posse cut doing. Because with jazz, it's like okay, this dude's on instrumental, this dude's doing this, whatever. Yeah. But like rap, it's like everybody spit a verse. But I couldn't imagine it working in like. A genre like rock because like how yeah how just it'd that? be so strange um moving on to the next tune fireflies um can i believe your eyes there's 10 million, million fireflies, fireflies. <laughs> I, I had i'm sorry i had to <laughs> <laughs> I, I when i saw that <laughs> no i literally my first note in here is uh you would not believe your eyes if 10 million fireflies and then i go on to my actual notes of the song. and that's just for me i'm not sharing this with anyone <laughs> i like how we went on had the same thought about the same quote in this song that has I guess so many quotables but it's like I thought about it and I was like I'm gonna say that when we get to that song and you just casually just typed it up I, I, I literally just wrote them as normal sentences I wrote you would not believe your eyes period if 10 million fire flies period and then I went on to say <laughs> yeah and then that's it um <sighs> but w- what did you think of, of this tune because i feel like i'm just gonna i'm just gonna start guessing what you think of these songs i'm gonna okay. guess that you of the more electronic ones you probably like this one a little bit better you would be absolutely 80 percent correct no, I'm just I'm, I'm messing with you. You're right. I, I was more thrown off by absolutely 80%. <laughs> like <laughs> just you, the very bold wording. Just like you can definitely maybe go to the bathroom if you want sometimes. I just imagine like a gold plated 80% plaque. <laughs> like instead just, of like it just, 100% it's got like a success. golden shield and like the plaque just reads definitely 80%. Right, exactly. Um no, I did actually enjoy this record. And in fact, I think I enjoyed every song in the latter half of this record. Anything everything from, after Solemn, basically. Everything after Solemn, I liked. Um, yeah, Fireflies. So then I guess I would say that I liked this album. Oh, there you go. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, so Fireflies was a really interesting tune to me. And I think at first it didn't stand out. But as I listened to it on my second, third, et cetera, listen, mm-hmm. um, I found it to be really engaging and I, it's it's like this ethereal piece that you can just escape into. Mm-hmm. And I think this is probably one of the most like just dream pop songs that they have on this record, which is interesting that that influence um, that shows itself so many times on this album. But this one is really delving more than any other song. And it's also one of the most typically structured songs with this one being like probably one of the only that has like a discernible chorus and expected repetition. Mm -hmm. So it's one that provides just that musical familiarity to a lay person. Like this would be a song I would probably show someone from this album because it does have, it kind of felt like a nice, like, I mean, I, and I understand that it had a traditional makeup, but that, sort of traditional structure with songs was kind of a nice breakup of everything. Absolutely. And it was just like, okay, you know, you are getting away from everything. building structure. Yes. And more so into your, you know, verse chorus. Right. And it kind of, you know, if solemn was fatiguing, I feel fireflies was refreshing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, even though like it's coming after ARP and I do love that song. Um, it's kind of like okay, let's kind of break, fi- let's kind of break up this a little bit and kind of go into the last couple records, you yeah. know, kind of, you know, kind of breaking the feel a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so I think that actually on a straight through listen makes the the two ending songs a lot stronger in my opinion. I think so too because it's like okay, because then you know I feel like in the last two records so they're kind of getting back to that sound and kind of more like into the first half of that record. But like, I feel like if we would have had another 
song that wasn't what flyer fireflies was kind of begin to the end of just like all right you know again that album fatigue that yeah talk about feeling so they definitely make use of dynamic songwriting on Mm -hmm. this album to break it up and feel organic also lyrically this probably has my favorite line which is um and i'll get a thousand hugs from 10 million lightning bugs (laughs) (laughs) i didn't think you're gonna bring it back like that yo that was magnificent i just want to listen to fireflies now (laughs) i don't but yeah (laughs) Come on, dude. Isn't this an Owl City review? Is that, is that not what we're doing? Are we going to do Owl City one of these days? You know what? I don't know. <laughs> I've I, never actually possible. heard an Owl City like song besides Fireflies. Yeah, same though. Same. Same. Yeah. So actually, yeah. it would be very... It'd be so strange. I feel like I'd be living within the twilight zone (laughs) (laughs) listening to an a proper album from al city which i don't know if that person is musically active still or what i think so um Mm. well well, then yeah we're gonna do the thing when we go just review a bunch of old albums i guess no we're gonna do that uh we're gonna do al city we're gonna do uh my chemical romance and it just (laughs) i will never ever go back and just try and review my chemical romance you can't do it (laughs) it would just be weird it'd just be so strange because it's like everyone already has their opinion on that record that's true you know yeah i feel like for me it's the equivalent of trying to review like 36 chambers by wu-tang clan it's like we know that that record's phenomenal like let's yeah. just go on about our like lives now you it's know? just like by the end of the review everyone just be like yeah yeah no totally <laughs> right like um so moving on to nothing sometimes at twice <laughs> track nine <laughs> track no. nine everything all at once um goodness I'm going to guess that you loved this song. I did, but your jokes are coming in strong, <laughs> and I love this. <laughs> um, so this was another single from the record, because I had five singles on this 10-track album. I was about, I was about <laughs> to say, I'm like, what? How many singles were there? Oh, my God. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, so this one starts off with like the most in-your-face bass line. Um, and also this is probably the most satisfying as like a, um, just a guitar enthusiast, everything like that. So raw. And you've also got a ton of really cool effects going on in the background that are just like, you can tell they're just playing around, but it's, it's done in such a cool way. And the entire track is just completely brutal with an even more brutal ending. Like you could, one could say that you're just given everything, like all at once. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do love this record very, very, or the song. I keep saying record and song interchangeably. I mean, it doesn't really matter. We'll but fix I, it in post. Oh really? No. Are you gonna do no. I was like are you gonna just say song, song and like <laughs> over the top of me? <laughs> oh man. Um but yeah, any any other comments about that tune? Just loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved fair, it. Fair, fair, fair. Absolutely fair. Um last track on the album, uh, Half the World. Uh, I <laughs> Way to close a record. Oh, yeah. Way to close a record. This song, again, besides uh, this song, along with ARP, is another hugely vocally forward song. Mm -hmm. This is also, in my opinion, the most dynamic song um, as far as just, just having your peaks and valleys and stuff like that it's just classic good songwriting yes and it's really just using a lot of those elements of songwriting that are historically successful 
Um, and it makes it such an engaging tune from start to finish. And even though it is long, most of the tunes on this record are pretty long. Yeah. Um, but this one feels like such an appropriate outro to the the album as a whole. It uses all the elements on the album and strings them together into an explosive yet somber journey. And that's a great word to use for this song. Just it a journey. Is, it feels it like really a journey. Is. Yeah. Just, and I feel like it, it's like if you were to sum up the way the record moves in a song, half the world is that song. Cause of course the, the album, as you mentioned, it did have these kind of like dips in, in the momentum and stuff like oh that. Oh my God. This song emulates that. You just blew my mind. <laughs> if you're like, if you said if you were to put the way the record moves in one song, it's half the world. And oh my gosh, you are entirely correct. And it it, it really makes you. It, it's an out. It's a song that, while it works within itself, it also makes you reflect on the album you just listened to. In that, to me, I couldn't ask for anything more in a closer. So yeah, I, it's funny because on to the bone, we loved the closing track, perhaps the most Yeah, on Milo. The closing track was the thing that made me hate the album's order. Yeah. And then this one again, amazing closing track. Beautiful. Wonderful close. Yeah. That's, I, I mean, nothing but positive things to say about half the world. Like just, using just good songwriting and emulating the movements of the album, just really summing up what you just listened to and does so in such a gratifying way and couldn't be happier with that song. It's such a great way to end an album. Um, so as far as my general thoughts, um, I mentioned how I feel like a lot of the songs in this album play out like two acts yeah. at times, whether it be like having an interlude at the end or changing drastically about halfway through the song. While there is the occasional time I literally had to check to see if I was still listening to the same song. I had to do that on, on multiple points. I was like, <laughs> did, because especially since I'm sitting there taking notes on, it, I'm like, Oh, did I move to a new song? Oh no, I didn't. <laughs> I uh, see I had that issue because I thought things completely stopped because like I have Spotify so it's just kind of like one of those times where I'm like yo am I, is my dad like what's yeah. going on <laughs> you know what I mean it's like oh um, but this this I mentioned Stephen Wilson's To The Bone um, these transitions kind of remind me of To The Bone uh-huh. but where To The Bone never ever delivered on giving you a dramatic shift yes because To The Bone of course mm. like would present this new musical idea give you a taste of it and then go right back into what you were just listening to right this album is is just unabashedly just giving you something new or just completely unafraid and just going, Hey, here's this new musical idea. And now the song is different. And I, I do enjoy that. Even though I didn't necessarily enjoy all the songs, it was like, at Mm -hmm. least those payoffs were payoffs. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we get to these new musical ideas, I'm like, Oh, at least you did something with it. Not to say that, you know, albums who don't do those payoffs or artists who don't do those payoffs are bad. Yeah. But it was just kind of nice to get those payoffs. It, it felt gratifying to yes. see a change in Ghost Summer, which is, of course, an element of progressive music to be unafraid of these drastic musical changes within a tune. Um, so I, 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 I genuinely like that element, though sometimes I would get confused on which song I was listening to. <laughs> um, production wise, there's some, I think, interesting choices on this album. Um, one, just like a general thought to hear Andrew Groves and in, in double track the vocals on some of the tunes, particularly like um, uh, Indigo was a new change. But uh, with the vocals, they're not mixed traditionally in that they're pulled back quite a bit in the mix, which I think is, it's not something new to the band, but I think this is done on a more extreme level on this record. Um, I will say I like that because I found that as a listener, because the vocals are set back a little bit, I have to lean into the song. Mm. And you can't ignore the musical elements because you're leaning into the vocals. 
because as a from a songwriting standpoint um vocals is a way to get immediate interest because we hear a human voice and we listen by putting those back you really have to get into the soundscapes um especially when you're looking at tracks like before me where you're really kind of in the wall of sound um because the vocals are so far back in there now the caveat is that i know like none of the lyrics to this record (laughs) (laughs) I've always struggled with like hearing what he's saying and not just because the vocals are always pushed back, but because he has such a unique singing style to where he like will enunciate in very particular ways or like vowels will be expressed in a certain way that it's really hard for me to tell what he's saying. Mm. And that is definitely true on this record. I don't know any of the actual lyrics and I, there weren't like any I could find online that were reliable. Really? They were all just kind of, yeah, it's such a new record, and they're not that popular of a band. Oh, so it takes, yeah. So, and so of course, I couldn't really hear the lyrics, but at the same time, I think the decision to put the vocals so far back is crucial to the sound of this album. This is not a pop record. You're not supposed to just be, like, remembering the vocal melody only. That's right. not what this album's about, especially with the new direction. However, while I agree with that decision... I sometimes feel like it is a little inconsistently delivered across the product with some songs seem to have a greater vocal presence than others. And while I feel like in certain moments that's intentional, it kind of feels a little confusing and questionable at other times where I'm, I almost don't know if it was on purpose or because there's just some inconsistent mixing across the album. Again, I don't really know. It's hard to say on that, but that is one thought that I did have about the vocal production because you did have some songs where like the vocals are riding on top Mm -hmm. and then some other songs where the vocals are pressed far beneath and you're really leaning in and of course that could be a conscious decision depending on the song and i would i would agree with where they are for the most part for that um but as a whole i feel like this album serves as a statement of revitalization for the band um It's a statement that they stand behind with a strong foot forward, and I think it'll serve well for them in the future. Uh, I love them as a progressive post-hardcore outfit, and I need to show you some of their past material because I know that you will way interested. Yeah, you will love that kind of stuff because that is something that they definitely shine in. Um, But this album, to me, heightens the stakes. It brings a beautiful blend of electronic music and dream pop influence to a band that could have just stayed the same again, Mm -hmm. Um, especially since their last full length album was four years ago. So to have something that would have been just the same could have potentially just been okay. Yeah, it It, it would have been safe and it would have been. It could have still been very enjoyable, but nothing that stood out. And I think especially a band that in their position would probably like to be a little bit bigger than where they are. I mean, of course, every band wants to be bigger than where they are. But um, they, I think, needed a change like this. Um, and to me, this album has reshattered my expectations of what a three-piece band can deliver musically with such huge walls of sound from three people. And I think Andrew grows taking on the keyboard as an additional element overall serves this record. Well, um, it's a little conflicting as a fan of their past work. And of course, clearly you like that, those elements a little bit more. Yeah. And I, I do kind of live for those moments on this record. I agree with their decision even if some of my favorite parts are still those old elements. Mm, mm, mm. Um, So for me, I'd call this album definitely good. I thoroughly enjoyed the record personally. Um, It's an album that I'm definitely going to continue to visit. um, Look back at, I will say this album definitely also made me uh, listen to their other material as well. Um, So if you listen to this album and you really liked 
um, tracks like ARP, uh, tracks like Off the Floor, The End of Curtains, um, and some of the other tunes, you're going to like their past material a lot. It's all very guitar-centric, um, rhythmically challenging, and more vocally forward. If you didn't like the dream pop elements on this record, give their, give their old stuff a shot. Because um, this is definitely a new direction. But I, I, I'll conclude with I thought this album was definitely good. Um, if you want to check out this album, if you haven't already, you can follow our Spotify playlist um, that has all the albums that we review on it. Uh, also, don't forget to check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Mostly Existential, or you can just search the Mostly Existential podcast on Facebook. Next week, we are going to be listening to... We have an album by uh, a rapper named Rhapsody, and okay. the album is called Layla's Wisdom. I had alluded to previously um, that we were going to do Open Mic Eagle or mm -hmm. suggested that we were going to do Open Mic Eagle. But so much time has passed since that record dropped onto reviewing, and I've listened to it a lot, um, that I feel that I personally have listened to it too much to have any sort of fresh ideas um, to bring to the table when talking about it. So um, Rhapsody, her album just dropped the 22nd. How is Rhapsody spelled? Because I feel like that could be any number of words. R A P S O D Y. Oh, okay. So like the word Rhapsody. Okay. Yeah. So um she's the leading artist on Jamla Records, and I'll you know, do a quick review of her as an artist when we review it next week. Mm. Um but yeah, I definitely do like her work. Um Great MC has done collaborations with um like Kendrick Lamar, he was on, um, to, she was on to pimp a butterfly. Oh, okay, cool. And yeah, so, and it's kind of, it's kind of nice because it feels like with the different sort of, um, with the different sort of features we have on here, just kind of looking at the track list, we see her kind of making a big push or at least getting the respect that she deserves. Mm-hmm in rap because i'm looking at the track list right now we have kendrick lamar we have you know other classic mcs like we have black thought buster rhymes is on here you know we definitely have you know a lot of work she also has uh terrence martin on here who does instrumentals he did a lot of work for to pimp a butterfly as well so i'm definitely interested in how this album is going to play out mm -hmm. um Again, great MC. You know, I don't particularly like tagging the whole she's a female MC. Yeah. I don't like saying that. If you're a rapper, you're a rapper. If you're dope, you're dope. Like, yeah, let's for not. Sure, for <laughs> sure. You know, so that's what we're going to be checking out next week. Yeah, uh, I'm excited for that. I will be listening to that. We'll both be listening to that. Hopefully you'll be listening to that. It'll already be on the playlist when this comes out. We'll always have the next week's album on there so that way you can get a head start and have your opinion about the album ready. If you want to debate us, we will have a little thing for that on Facebook about this album. We'd love to talk more about it with you guys. Um, until then, we will see you next time. Using the same baseline as an outro. <laughs> so check this out um this past weekend i was given a job opportunity by a customer who was just like hey give me your name and phone number and you know my vp's looking for people and we'll see what's up so i thought i was well gonna done. go in and just like oh this is a like some sort of you know interview or whatever i'm gonna check out the company and see right. if they can find anywhere to fit so i was misinformed i thought she said that she started out as a male lady for this company and just kind of like through timing and diligence kind of got a decent position and mm -hmm. i was like oh i can deliver mail around an office building that sounds tight yeah no i walked into a room with a bunch of people and they gave me a name tag and it said, had my name in the person who invited me and other people with name tags with their names and the persons that invited them. And then I was like, 
Is this a pyramid scheme? It, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, it totally feels like a pyramid scheme. And I won't necessarily say... I, don't, I mean, because here's the thing is, so the, the, the technical name for it is multi-scale marketing, I believe. Right. And it's not like every one of those are bad. It, there were like a few when that first became popular, the multi-scale marketing mm-hmm. that were really shady companies. Right. And so now you have the term pyramid scheme where, you, you know, you can, you can argue back and forth about whether or not multi-scale marketing is, is really that good but some companies are actually extraordinarily successful doing that i know some people that are involved in those Mm -hmm. and some of them make bank right but here's the issue though is Mm -hmm. with this particular one it doesn't necessarily feel right okay like so I come in and they're talking to me and I'm talking to all sorts of people. And then there's one common thread that I keep hearing that people are like reinforcing to me of you don't have to be good at math to do this job. That seems like a very weird thing to say. Well, because that's the thing is like this woman walked up to me and she was like, Oh, you know, she's talking is like, oh, I used to do this before this. Like, this is my first actual job. Da 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 da. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm in college right now, whatever. And then she's like, oh, what do you go to college for? I'm like, oh, psychology. And she's like, oh, see, you're gonna be like me. You are. You're not gonna be good at the math part, but you're gonna be good at the at the caring about people part that is required to do this job. And I thought to myself, I'm like, first of all, who told you I was bad at math? Yeah, like, like honestly, like, me personally, I'd be super offended at that, especially because I I take pride in my math skills, and I right. feel like you're probably also good at math I, to some degree. Yeah, I know my way around <laughs> math. Like I can, like I, I mean, granted. Like, you know, For real, like two plus two equals four minus one is three. Quick math. Quick math. Quick math. <laughs> like I, I should have just brought out some quick maths for her. But uh, yeah, I, I love quick maths anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just one of those things. So we go upstairs and we sit in this room and they're giving us a presentation. And, you know, one of the dudes is like, you know, this is what we do. So apparently the idea of the job is it's a financial service company and okay. the financial service company. Like, you know how insurances will, you know, I think Progressive did this for a while where they would show you their rate, but also the rate of their competitors to see which plan works best for you. Yeah. So basically, this financial company does that, just they don't have a plan of their own. They just help you figure out what plan is best for you and transfer money. But that's fine, except they never told me how it worked. Like, in the sense of, like, okay, what like am I actually... Like, the logistics? Act- like, how, what am I actually going to do? Right, like, what is your day-to-day look like instead of just like yeah this is the basis of what we do but like if you were to describe jobs in that broad sense Uh everyone at the end of the interview would be like so uh what am i doing (laughs) like because a typical interview involves like job responsibilities and stuff like that and you'd be like oh well you know you'd be expected to put away inventory blah 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 but it sounds like all they did was just like what we do is we sell things and you're like cool so like what do i do though well their whole thing was like we don't actually have a product and this is about caring for people and then the second guy comes up to uh present first of all the the uh the title of vp is very loose in this company vp is more of a level of if you make x amount of money in x amount of time you will be like get the vp title and i'm like okay it's not how companies work because they're like oh i don't you know i didn't like the corporate ladder thing and i want everybody to be on the same playing field and this and that and i'm like yeah but how does it work though like what do i do also like where does the money come from like do you just guys take like a percentage or something like apparently described by um businessman who was actually looking really fresh like don't get me wrong he was actually very nicely dressed um when we they uh financial service companies basically pay this company to do their job which is sign people up for their plans and stuff like that Mm -hmm. so whenever we sign people up then they give us 
then they pay us for that and I think we get like a percentage of it. I'm actually very gray on the details because they right. weren't explained well. Um but yeah, and then like when I started cuz they had me for a little bit mm-hmm. cuz they're like, "Oh, yeah, you can do this part-time. You really, you know, all of the money you make is based off how many clients you see. So if you see a couple clients a week, you can make X amount of money and whatever, whatever you can do this part-time." Right. Um one knock against it, it's all the way out like on the 51 and camelback and i'm not doing that ever interesting that they have a location i find that a lot of multi-scale marketing things uh-huh. i guess because a lot of them are based around selling a product they don't require any centralized building per se yeah no they actually have like an office okay. building which was also kind of cool it was nifty but it was like okay i'm doing this fine and i was thinking about it for a little bit but then the guy, like, he kept going on and on and on. And he kept selling the advantages of this job, like, in the sense of, like, oh, if you make this much money, you can go on our, like, um, you can go on our company trips. Like, it's like we go to Puerto Rico, we go on cruises, we go on whatever. But I'm like, yeah, but I still have no idea how to do this job. Right. I feel like it's, um, that those kinds of companies and call centers are like the only two jobs that I've ever come across that try and sell you a job. Right. You know what I mean? Cause it's like when it comes to call centers, it's like everyone in, in their twenties are just like, yeah, I want to hate myself even more. So, <laughs> and, but they, they sell you on these perks. Right. And And also another thing that kind of got to me is the person who gave me this opportunity and called me down there made it seem like she'd been doing this for a while. Mm -hmm. But when I got down there, it was presented to everyone in the room. Like this was the first time ever. So I'm like, they're hiring in mass. They're a financial uh, services company headed by people who don't have background in financial services, hiring mm-hmm. people in math, in mass, geez, <laughs> who don't have backgrounds in financial services. That's so weird. Everything like, and everything felt weird. So then when I got home, I was looking up information about the company. One thing that got to me is there was no actual, like anywhere to be found negative, like, um, Nothing negative was said about the company hmm. ever. Um, I went to Better Business Bureau's website to kind of look it up and see whatever. Everything was like five star reviews with people who had company in their thumbnail, like an image that said company. And I'm like, no, no, this is weird. And then they have a YouTube page, which doesn't have a lot of videos. It has a um a video about this guy who's like, Oh, he's the next one in this company's, um, millionaire club and da, 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 da. And I was like, uh, okay. Then the other videos are their trips to like Puerto Rico and whatever. Mm-hmm. And then one of them was a video of their giant Las Vegas conference, but has no footage of people speaking. Hmm just has like a montage of images, images of people that I actually did see at this thing. So I'm like, okay, whatever. But it was like, it would just say things of like opportunity winner team building. And I'm like, just like buzzwords that don't really have any substance. I don't like this because you're asking me to come back in within 24 to 48 hours of getting this presentation strictly within 24 or 48 hours of getting this presentation. Mm -hmm. And I still have yet to know anything about this company like i know what you guys do and i know but like other than that i don't know how this works at all and i can't find any information about you guys on the internet like albeit even if the positive information is there i can't find anything yeah all you see is a bunch of just like you can be a winner too that or it's just like videos on how to like spot a pyramid scheme and it's like if you guys like 
nothing about it feels right to me. So I'm like, yeah. yeah. I was supposed to go in back in today, it, today being the day that we record this, not the day that it's coming out. Uh-huh. Um, but no. Yeah. That and also, like, even if it was, like, li- if it was what I felt legitimate, because I'm trusting my gut here, I was told mm-hmm. by my therapist that I need to do that more, and it just doesn't feel like a good fit. I know I've been wanting a new job. I'll just go work at a Starbucks or something like it just. Yeah. Nothing about this feels good. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to do that. For and I sure. don't want to drive out to f- the 51 in Camel. No, I, yeah. I don't want to make that drive. I just simply don't want to do it. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, that was my uh, 10 minute pre-roll. So I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. <laughs>